Hello and welcome back to the Five Cent Cigar Newscast. I'm Imani Fleming. Thank you so much for joining us. Coming up this week, we have how URI's Watershed Watch program has continued monitoring the safety of various waterways despite COVID-19 restrictions, the newly approved bond to vastly improve the Fine Arts Center, and as always, make sure to stick around for your Brody Sports Corner. URI's volunteer-based water monitoring program, Watershed Watch, provides current information on the quality of surface water resources throughout Rhode Island. Since the start of the pandemic, the research group has made certain adjustments to operations and procedures in order to adhere to COVID safety guidelines. Still, they've made substantial progress in their work despite the loss of in-person facilitation. I sat down with program director Elizabeth Heron to find out more. The Watershed Watch program at the University of Rhode Island trains volunteers on how to take weekly measurements of various bodies of water. Despite the pandemic, the program's goals have remained the same, to educate the public on water quality information and obtain data to ascertain water conditions and detect trends. Program Director Elizabeth Heron tells us more about changes made to the program's operations and procedures in order to safely continue their research. Train them to use well-established monitoring parameters so that they can help us to generate understanding of our water. Lakes, ponds, rivers, streams, um, salt ponds, ocean beaches, you know, pretty much you name it, we have volunteers monitoring it. Heron says that the biggest loss was not being able to train and assist volunteers in person. We lost a lot of that face-to-face -face, um, interaction. Um, in some cases, we lost some, you know, the, the, the sign-in data, you know, they, they would drop their bottles and leave that normally we'd be there to, okay, make sure, ask questions and that sort of thing. So. Um, it was a little bit of a learning curve for us all. Heron and her team have created online courses for the program's volunteers in the absence of in-person training classes. Yeah, so the, the training one you know, in particular, you know, we did do online classroom training and develop some um, field training videos. That has been a big shift, but otherwise, you know, for the most part, you know, we've been really, really lucky. In terms of major data changes, Heron says that increased outdoor activity and dry weather have affected the waters. I suspect that when we can, are able to look at the data and put it into context with other years, that we may see a difference. The other problem um, with really being able to pick up any kind of an indicator in our water quality data from last year was it was also an incredibly dry year. She says volunteers took advantage of every opportunity to be outside. You know, people loved having a purpose and, you know, being, you know, it wasn't just going outdoors and having fun or, you know, they really, it gave them a destination, it gave them a purpose, it gave them an excuse to go outdoors. And last year, people really, really needed that. To find out more on URI's Watershed Watch program and ways you can get involved, you can visit their university homepage. Reconstruction on URI's Fine Arts Center, or as our students call it, the FAC, began in 2018. The university is set to continue renovations on the building's classrooms, performance spaces, and exterior. Leah Crowley has the story. URI's Fine Arts Center is often described as ugly. When I asked music department chair Mark Conley to describe the building, this was his reaction. <laughs> um, how, how would you like me to do that? <laughs> However you honestly feel about the building itself, whether that's positive or negative. So we have a very interesting relationship with our building over here at Fine Arts. Um, we, we are so used to it um, that we've sort of developed a kind of a love-hate relationship with it, a certain pride that we make do with it, but it's not, um, it's not ideal. It has a sort of bunker quality to it, which I think has sort of led us over time to sort of get a bunker mentality. Faculty and students don't just have problems with the building because of its outward appearance. I mean, we've had um, water leaks fall right on grand pianos um, during performances. We have put buckets in between string players and a string quartet at times in our concert hall. Students who use the Fine Arts Center have noticed its shortcomings. So have you experienced any problems because of the building, whether it's with your light directing or just having a class? Like, have you ever experienced it? Have you, how honest do you want me to be? I want you to be brutally, brutally honest. honest. Okay. This building um, is falling apart at the seams. That water dripping on grand pianos has earned itself a nickname. So our roof is kind of just a mishmash of shredded wheat collecting water, leaking sludge. We affectionately call this fact juice. 
The reason the curtains are out there in the lobby is because that's covering the juice wall. It runs down the walls. It gets <laughs> cleaned up every day or so. Before COVID, we would see janitors and people constantly wiping down the walls. I remember one of my favorite leaks was in the hallway outside by the lobby. A bit of water leakage came down, started a little fire from the lights, and because it was still leaking, put itself out. One of these over here is where that little uh, exciting fire was. During shows, we have to be very careful in J Studio, which if it's pouring outside, the ceiling will drip on the lights. The theater department's last show before COVID-19 almost had to be canceled due to the water leaks making the stage slippery. And it came down and it hit the stage. It was extremely dangerous. Despite its problems, the Fine Arts Center is still loved. It is our home, you know, and for many of the students, even beyond the faculty, you know, they're arriving nine o'clock in the morning and they're leaving at 11 o'clock at night. Howard described the need for more space as URI's art programs continue to grow. Those spaces become cramped. They become um, difficult for the students to have the full experience. The program's wish for more space may actually soon be granted. On March 2nd, voters cast their ballots in favor of a bond that grants URI $57.3 million that will go towards renovating the Fine Arts Center behind me. I think everybody's really excited. You know, the president, the provost, the deans have always been incredibly supportive of our work. However, it is hard to bring people to a space that um, that doesn't feel overly welcoming. It doesn't feel Im important. And I think this will raise the level to some degree. Like Howard, Conley is excited about the center's future and stressed the importance of investing in the arts. When people are oppressed, or when they have something to say that others don't want to hear, one of the most effective ways to do that is through music. And so it tends to be trivialized by those who have power, and it tends to be elevated by those who don't. And I think there's a lot of value in that. Leah Crowley reporting, Five Cent Cigar News. And now over to Ania Khan Okan with your Roadie Sports Corner. Thanks, Imani. Welcome back. I'm Ania Khan Okan, and this is your Roadie Sports Corner. 664 days separated home games for the Rhode Island baseball team, but they finally got the chance to step back out on Bill Beck Field when they took on the UMass Lowell Riverhawks this past weekend in the three-game series. Temperatures were in the lower 30s when these two teams faced off for the first time Saturday afternoon. UMass Lowell would get on the board first in the third inning with a single down the right field line from Keegan Calero, bringing home Robert Gallagher to make the score 1-0. The Rams would only need one inning to take control of this game. In the fifth, redshirt senior Josh Berdu gets the RBI single to tie the score at one. Next batter, Jordan Lasky hits it in the infield, but the Riverhawks struggle to field it in, scoring Austin White to give Rhodey the 2-1 lead. Next batter, Xavier Vargas brings home the man that got it all started, Josh Brodeur, to give Rhodey their third run of the inning. They would eventually hold on and beat the Riverhawks 3-1 to take game one of the series. In game two, junior Xavier Vargas would be the star of the show. Here in the bottom of the first, the single would bring home Josh Bordeaux to give Rhodey a 1-0 lead. An inning later, Tino Salgado would ground out, but it would allow Mark Coley to score from third base to make the score 2-0. Vargas would once again help the Rams get on the scoreboard with this single in the fifth inning, scoring Austin White and Tino Salgado. He would finish the game hitting 2-3 for three with 3 RBIs. The Rams also got tremendous pitching from Mike Webb, who would go the distance throwing seven strikeouts and only allowing two hits. Rhodey would shut out the Riverhawks in game two, four to nothing. It was a much more competitive ball game in the final game of the series. With the score tied at one in the sixth, Vargas would pick up where he left off in game two, driving the single down the right field line to bring home Tino Salgado. Rhodey up two to one. The Riverhawks would counter in the eighth with this single from Jimmy Sullivan to bring home Jerry Syracuse to tie the score back up at two. 
Half an inning later, Max Mikrovich would give Brody the lead for good with this RBI single, bringing home Austin White to take the 3-2 lead. Two batters later, Sonny Elena would add to the Brody lead with this shot to center field, scoring Greg Cavallari and Max Mikrovich. Brody would complete the sweep, defeating the Riverhawks 5-2. Coach Serrano spoke after the game about how nice it was to finally play at home with how the past year has been. It's been a tough year. I think, I mean, you know, obviously with everything, baseball is secondary. It's been a tough year for everybody. Um, but it's it's nice to play at home, um, you know, to not have to travel and bus or fly. You know, it's, 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 uh, it's nice to be at our own field, you know, to go through our own routine. Um, and our, t- our field is tough to play at because it's, especially early in the year, it's cold, it's windy. Um, it's not an easy place to play, and we're used to it. The team will return this Saturday for a two-game series against in-state rival Bryant. Both games are scheduled for 1 p.m. In cross-country, Lotta Black will run in her second consecutive NCAA cross-country championships this weekend after winning her second straight A-10 title last weekend. Women's tennis also locked up their first win against Bryant last weekend, winning 4-3. Thanks for tuning in to your Roadie Sports Corner. Until next time, I'm Inyakon Okan. According to URI's COVID-19 tracker, for the week of March 1st through March 7th, there have been 182 positive cases with a 2.45% positive test rate. That's all we have for you this week at the 5 Cent Cigar Newscast. Stay safe, Roadie.